continue on, on this example and uh, try to remember this k factor, which means the number of units produced by one worker in one day. And of course, this is an average value. So, uh, but still, the average value is what we should use in, in the models to try to, to find a production plan which, which meets the demand or the cumulative demand for all the months. And we have seen that we, by just looking at the month as, uh, well, single units with the, uh, and assuming that each month will be able to produce uh, the exact same number of units, we have found one critical month where we should try to uh, to adjust and uh, uh, and uh, adjust the production according to meet the cumulative demand for the critical month. But let's now try to remember this k factor, 0 0.3421. Again, just note that one up here. And we can remove these calculations here. Uh, the cumulative demand will be the same, but now we also need to adjust the cumulative production because we will uh, uh, we will need to include the number of working days for each month. <coughs> so this is about the k factor still, and the k factor in the sa same number here, about dividing the production of 520 for a given period, which is 40 days, made by 38 uh, workers. And also, you, well, you will have in the assignment and also in other, other problems, you will usually be given such historical data and you need to uh, calculate and find the k factor according to production over a well, given time with a given number of workers. So now we are given here the different number of working days per month. And as we can see, it is varying quite much. 22 in January, 16 in February, then 23, 20, 21, 17, 18, and 10. So let's now try to make a new table, or a new column in the table, of course. Uh, the forecast or the, the expected demand is the same, the cumulative demand is the same, but now the number of days can be put in this column here, 22, 16, 23, and 20. And 21, 22, 21, and 20. No. Twenty-two, sixteen. 16. Strange. This is not exactly the same example, but uh, okay, I have to, to follow the example in my, my notes. So then we assume the number of days given here. Uh, 22 January, 16, 23, 20, 21, 22, and 21 and 22 for the eight months of January to August. And we can make a new table or a new column in the table about the cumulative number of days. How many days? how many working days you have up to that particular month. Twenty-two in January, twenty-two plus sixteen is thirty-eight days for January and February. And twenty-three in addition, which means sixty-one. Twenty for April, a total of eighty-one until April. And then 102, 124, 145, and 167. So in the full period, the whole uh, 
forecasting period or, or the time horizon here from January to August, you will have a total of 167 working days. What we now need to... Question? Well, I, I'm, I was not aware. I, I have some other no, uh, numbers in my notes, so uh, I'd rather use them so to make sure that uh, the calculations are, are correct. So we can just forget about this one, go to the previous one. What is important here, the k, k factor, and then let's uh, uh, well, look at these numbers given here. I'm not sure why. I've, uh, for some reason, the, my notes uh, have different numbers than on, on the on the PowerPoint file. But anyway, we are given, the principle of is of course uh, the same anyway. The, we are given a number of working days in each month and adding all the days up to that particular month so will give us the cumulative number of days. So what we now should try to find is still the critical month. And the critical month can be found by dividing the cumulative demand by the cumulative number of days. Uh, so this can now be yeah. cumulative demand by number of days. And then we divide 220 to 22 which should be quite easy, 10. We divide 500 to 38, then we get 13.16, uh, we divide 960 by 61, and we get a number of 15.74, we divide 1150 to 81, the number is 14.20 and 14.60 divided by 102 should be 14.31 16.05 divided by 124 is 12.94 and 17.15 divided by 145 will be 11.83 and at last 1940 divided by 167 is 1162. And now, the critical ratio, or the, the critical month here, is the month with the highest value when you are dividing the cumulative demand to the cumulative number of days. The highest value is still in March, 15.74, which means still when we are uh, including the number of working days and not assuming that you have the exact the same production every month at, as we did in the first simplified example, still March is the critical month. And we need to make a plan. In this case, we are talking about a constant workforce. So we need to employ the number of people necessary to meet the demand in March. We have to produce at least 960 units in January, February, and March. This is the critical month. And now we have the highest number in this uh, column here, 1574, to find the number of workers We take this number, 15.74, and divide by k. k is the number of units produced per day, per person, on average. And we can then divide this number, which is found as the cumulative demand divided by the cumulative number of days in the critical month, which is March, the highest number from this column, divided by the k factor. And we get, in this case, exactly 46, by some co coincidence. So this means this company 
to be able to meet the cumulative demand here, the company have to employ 46 persons. And this is the number of workers needed by using the constant workforce uh, strategy. So let's now make, a, well, just note this number of workers as 46. And we can now try to find the final production plan because number of workers is 46. Then production plan can be found by multiplying the number of workers by the number of days by K. Yeah, we can just use this W as the variable for, we know it's 46, number of workers. So the production is the W multiplied by the K value multiplied by the number of days in that particular month. And then 46 multiplied by 0 0.3421 will then give us the number of workers multiplied by the production per worker per day. So this will now be the daily production. Uh, the W multiplied by K is the daily production and multiplied by the number of days. So we will have the values shown here, 346. 46 multiplied by the K value multiplied by 10. Uh, and next, 252. And to 362. And 315. 330. 3, 346. 330. And 346. And then again, find the cumulative production. And we, uh, yeah, let's see here, cumulative production, 346 in January, in January and February, the sum of these two numbers, which is 598. And add this together, we get a total of 960. And we remember that March was the critical month 960 production and 960 in demand. So here we will meet the demand exactly. But still, we will now have overproduction in the remaining months. So continuing here, producing, well, adding up the next uh, value in, in the uh, column here, we will get uh, 1275, we will get 1605. We get 1951, 2281, and at last 2627. So, looking at the inventory, we can have the last column here. The inventory on stock after each month will then be the cumulative production minus the cumulative demand. 346 minus 220 is uh, 126. Uh, we have 598 minus 598, 960 minus 960, and then we can see that the stock level uh, uh, will increase for the remaining months. 125, 145, 346, 
566 and 687. A total of 2093. The stock level at the end of August is 687, but in total you have stored 2093 items from one period to the next period. And this is what we are calculating when, uh, when we are calculating the costs of this policy, is the cost of storing one item from one month to the next. <coughs> Okay, here is the correct number of working days. So for some reason the previous slide was wrong. Mm, we blame that on the authors of the book because they have provided this uh, set of, of slides. So <coughs> if we now want to add cost, because what we will do is to try different uh, plans, different production plans, and see which of them are the most effective or which of them are the, uh, the cheapest, which is the most expensive, and we will have to choose regarding, uh, well, cost of the, of the different types of plants. So if we now add costs here, we have different costs. The holding cost is uh, also called inventory cost, is the cost of storing one item or one unit in one month, which in this case is said to be $8.50. And the cost for this policy with a total of 2,093 items stored from one month to the next, this is the sum of the numbers in this column, it will be quite costly. We have to multiply this number by this number, which is the cost per unit. We also have what we call the hiring cost, or the cost of changing the uh, number of workers. And to hire one person, it is here uh, uh, said that you have to calculate by $800. To get rid of a person, firing a person, or eventually placing that person in or uh, you don't have to fire directly, but you can maybe well, give one person other uh, tasks in the, in the company. But still, it might be costly, might need some, uh, uh, well, some education and some uh, time to, to start in, in the new job. Um, so it is uh, co uh, calculated by a cost of $1,250. Uh, the payroll cost will then be the cost per worker per day. In this example, it's said to be $75. For each worker working in one day, you have to pay $75. And you're also given here what we call the shortage cost, which is said to be $50 per unit short per month. But in our plan here, we don't have any shortage. We don't plan with shortage. That's, well, we might come back to that later and when we start with uh, with stochastic or uncertain uh, demand, uh, we don't know the exact value on, on the demand, then we usually have to uh, calculate with shortage cost. So in uh, a more advanced models, you also need to calculate this. It, it might be in some cases that you rather should have a shortage uh, or calculate with a shortage because it will be cheaper to lose a sale than to have a very large stock like this, very high overproduction. That might be uh, the policy in some, some cases. So trying to calculate the cost of this particular constant workforce plan, we assume that we had 40 persons employed by the end of December. And we remember we need 46 from January. That means we have to employ six new workers to a cost of 800. Uh, inventory cost total of 2093, the sum of the end inventory in all the months, and 
Still, we remember, add in 100 units netted out in August. It was the 100 units we added to the forecasted demand to get this number. These are also on stock and needs to be calculated in, in the cost of the plan. So that means a total of 2,193 at a cost of 8.50. Total cost 18,640.50, which is, as you can see in this case, much higher than the cost of hiring workers. So here the inventory cost is quite uh, relatively high in this policy. But the change of the workforce is only to hire six workers in January, and then for the remaining period, all 46 workers will be employed. So you don't have any other hiring cost in any other periods, and you don't have any firing cost. So you don't have to pay to get rid of people. Uh, but to get the exact value of the policy, we need to include the payroll cost, which is $75 per worker per day. You have 46 workers, and you have a total of 167 days. The cumulative number of days from January to August. Which is a total of $576,150. And this is, of course, the major part of the cost of this policy here. $576,150 plus $18,640.50 $18, plus $4,800 will give us a total cost here of $599,590.50. And we can try to remember this number because now we should try another strategy on the same example. <coughs> and this strategy is also something you will uh, uh, you have a, a problem on in in, uh, in your assignment. It's called the uh, chase strategy or the zero inventory strategy, and it's a totally different viewpoint. But because instead of looking at the number of workers necessary, it is aiming to reduce the inventory as much as possible. You should ideally have no inventory on stock at the end of each month. You should produce exactly the amount you need to meet the demand in each month. And then, of course, instead of varying the inventory here, you have to vary the number of workers. So in one month, you have to employ workers. In another month, you have to get rid of them. Yeah, OK, we'll have a few words on, on, on this before we start on that, because here, we also see that cost reduction in a constant workforce plan, you can use still, when you see you have a situation like this, you have a, uh, a critical month in March, and you can see according to, to the forecast and the uh, demand that the, uh, the stock will increase. We remember by using the angle here, we had quite much space between the production and uh, the demand in the last month. So we can have some kind of uh, uh, yeah, uh, try to adjust this constant workforce plan and say that, OK, we, maybe we don't need 46 workers for the whole period. We need them until March. And then we can just start all over again from March and calculate the new cumulative demand, cumulative number of days find the cumulative number of demand divided by the number of days and find the new critical month. And if we do that, start from March and start to put up this, uh, this table all over again, we will find a new critical month, which here is in May. So we will have some overproduction here in April, and then in May we have adjusted the number of workers in March. So we will have a new critical month here. And then after that critical month, we can try to set up a new plan for the remaining periods. So this is some kind of, uh, well, trying to level out the number of workers, but still having the number of workers as the, as the, major, uh, the more, more or less constant 
uh, number of workers uh, as the, uh, the main objective, at least for a shorter period. In this case, constant workforce from January to March, a new number from March to May, and a new number again from May to August. Uh, but still, this plan will be different than the next plan we will see, which is the chase strategy or the zero inventory, uh, inventory strategy. Yeah, not go into details here, but uh, the, the strategy I just uh, explained reduced the workforce from 236, so it well sacked or got rid of 10 persons in March, and then again reduced to 22 in, uh, uh, in the start of, of June. To have a constant production in a smaller number of, of periods than, than the, the full uh, time horizon. Uh, and then you got the plan here, which uh, was reduced uh, considerably uh, in the total cost. It was said to be uh, calculated to be 467,450. <coughs> now, let's have a look at this plan. Either called the zero inventory plan or the chase strategy. Always chasing and trying to get production, which fits as much as good as possible to the exact uh, demand for each month or for each period. So, uh, still, the K factor will be the same. For the, the example is the same, and we still know, independent of the strategy we are using for production, uh, we still should know or have an idea about uh, uh, how much will one person produce in one day. And the K factor is used to, uh, to uh, describe that number and it's based on historical uh, data. Okay, then we can also get rid of this, because no, it's not the cumulative demand we are uh, looking for, but we now want to find the demand and the number of days, and try to find out how much production do we need in each month, and how many workers do we actually need in each month. So let's now remember the number of days. And uh, it was 22, 16, 23, 20. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-one and twenty-two. Like this. So now Let's find the demand divided by the number of days in each month multiplied by the K factor. This will now give us the number of workers needed for each day. Demand or forecasted demand divided by the number of days multiplied by the K factor. The number of days multiplied by the K factor will tell you how many workers, uh, or the number of days multiplied by, by the K factor will tell you how much one worker will produce in one month. So. In January, one worker will produce 22 multiplied by 0 0.3421.
and if we now divide the demand or the forecasted demand to that number we will find out how many workers do we actually need in this case okay 220 divided by 22 multiplied by k will give us a total of 29.2 and since this might might be difficult to hire 0.2 persons we could round this up to 30. We cannot round down because then we will have we are not able to meet the exact production. We will have less than 220. But if we round upwards to 30, then we are able to meet the demand of 220 and we will still have some uh, some left on, on stock. Uh, next is uh, in uh, February dividing 280 and now we have only 16 days divided 280 to 16 multiplied by k will give us a number of 51.2 and then we should probably guess that we should round upwards but if we are analyzing this a bit Further, we can see that we will have some overproduction here, which can be used to meet the demand here. So in this case, we can actually run down to 51 and still be able to meet the demand. But if you are unsure, you should always round upwards. Otherwise, you need to, to check or control what is the exact production up to that point what is the exact cumulative production because usually rounding to integral number of, of workers you will have some overproduction in some of the previous period which might be used uh, to, to meet the demand in a, in a later period okay next will be 460 in March divided by 22 multiplied by K a number which is 58.5 and then we need to round upwards to 59. The next production or, or a demand of 190 divided by 20 days and multiplied by the K factor will be 27.8 rounded to 28. Uh, and we can continue 43.2 can be rounded to 43 because we have some overproduction in these two months 19.3 um, can also be rounded down and 15.3 uh, and 29.9 this can be 15 and this can be so now this numbers given here today uh, uh, had for yeah sure thank you 43 of course Is it uh, uh, which one? In March, 460 divided by 22 and the K. Uh, I got 58.5. Uh, okay, well, maybe there are some. Uh, I have to, to check that in, in the break. But, uh, Let's assume that my calculations are, are correct and uh, at least that the principle will, will be the same even if there are some miscalculations here. What? First one, 30. Because here we need to run up upwards. If we have only 29, then we will not have enough production because we will have maybe 218 or something. So in the first one, we always have to run upwards. But here we have some overproduction in January which means that we can use 
what we already have on stock, and we don't need to run upwards, we can run downwards here. So this is, but uh, as mentioned, if you are in doubt, use alway, run always upwards, because then you are, are sure. You might have some extra overproduction, but uh, still the number will not be, be so high. <coughs> and if we now assume uh, that these are the correct numbers, we can look at the workforce. And the uh, workforce, we remember we started with, uh, let's call that W0 was 40. That was given in, in the uh, problem text. We had 40 workers employed by the end of December, which means that we need to um, have or we can have two, two columns here that might make it easier. So then the H column uh, denotes the number of workers to hire, and the F column denotes the number of workers to fire. And using this strategy, you have to fire or get rid of 10 persons from December to January, because we only need 30. That's 10 in this column. Then we need 51 persons. We only have 30 persons in January. We need 51 in February. We need to hire 21 persons. In March, we need to hire eight more, from 51 to 59. But in April, from 59 and down to 28, we have to get rid of 31 persons. And then, from 28 up to 43, we have to hire 15. And uh, then we needed only 19, so we need to get rid of 24. And we need to fire four more from uh, June to July. And then we need to employ 15 from July to August. So this will now be the changes of the workforce in these eight months. And if we add together here, we'll get a total of 59 hiring and a total of 69 firing. And the difference from December to August is also minus 10, as you can see. You had fi hired 59 persons and you had fired 69 persons in, in this period. And here, well, we, we talked about uh, some sum over production because of rounding, so the, the inventory will not be exactly equal to zero, but still it will be very close to zero. And we also remember that the, the costs were rather well cheap compared to hiring and firing. The hiring costs were 800, the firing costs were 1,250, and the inventory costs, uh, holding cost were 8.50. So even if we have some items on stock at the end of this month, this number is quite small and we, well, we just don't go into details here. I will go through one more example in the next lesson and then we will sh show more details on how to calculate the, uh, the inventory cost. But now, total cost for this policy Okay, we assume inventory is close to zero. Zero, or it is very small at least, so we don't calculate that particular number. The hiring cost is 59 persons multiplied by 800. Which gives a total of, uh, yeah, I haven't calculated it. But I have the, the final sum. The firing costs was 69, and we remember we had to calculate 1,250 per person fired. And at last, the payroll cost. which was $75 per person, uh, 
per worker per day. And if we calculate the number of workers multiplied by the number of days, we will find that a total 5,689 working days were used. And this will in total give us a cost of 560,125. Which was a bit cheaper than the previous strategy, which had a cost of uh, 599,000, but we saw also that it was able to uh, to adjust that policy to get uh, down to 460 something. Yeah. Uh, this cost? Firing? Uh, yeah, sorry, of course. 69 multiplied by the firing cost, and 59 multiplied by the hiring cost. Gives us a total of uh, cost of, of this plan, which is 560,125. So, as mentioned, I will, uh, in, in the next lesson, in after the break, I will go through one more example uh, taken from the textbook on, on this example. But first, I will mention something about what we call linear programming and how to solve aggregate planning problems via linear programming. This is also a part of your assignment, and uh, the theory about linear programming will be presented on the lecture next week. Uh, and then, using so-called linear programming, which is a mathematical method, which is able to find the optimal combination. But what, what we have seen so far is the what we call extreme strategies, the zero inventory strategy, which always try to adjust the number of workers to the production needed, uh, and the constant workforce strategy, which is finding out how many people do you need to meet the production in the critical month. The optimal solution is usually some, somewhere between. And this is a mathematical uh, programming method which is able to identify the exact optimal solution. But still, the exact optimal solution will usually be a fraction, and that's not always uh, realistic to employ a person for 34% position, for example. Uh, so the, the might uh, the, well the optimal solution is not always what is uh, possible to obtain in in the real world. But still, we should learn how to create or find the optimal solution to these types of problem by using linear programming. Okay, we take a break and then I will continue with another example on the two extreme strategies uh, after the break. Okay.